Suppose the, it's cloudy out there, you cannot see the sun, right? How do you think Muslims will find out? There is an app for it. <laughs> there is. <laughs> okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start in the name of God, the most beneficent and merciful, and welcome and greet all of you with the Islamic greeting of Assalamu Alaikum. Do you know what it means? Anyone? It means may God's peace be, you know it, may God's peace be upon all of you. And the response to the greeting is Walaikum Assalam. That means may God's peace be upon you too. That's what we Muslims greet each other when we meet each other. And those from the Christian faith will be surprised to find out that that was also the greeting of Jesus, who we consider him as a mighty prophet. In the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse number 19, when he went to the upper chamber, the very first thing Jesus said to his disciples is, Peace be upon you. So welcome to the mosque. My name is Sabil Ahmed. I am one of the volunteers here, and I used to teach Sunday school here. And since my kids are off today, they're all here to help you out. They're in the back. <laughs> all right? <laughs> and my wife is there. Her friend is there. If you need any help, you know, in your stay here, they would be the one to help you out. This mosque is called the Muslim Community Center, MCC. This is called as the Mother Mosque of Chicago. How many of you have been to a mosque before? Okay, just three, four of you, right? What do you think happens in the mosque besides the five prayers? Yeah, it happened here too. What was that? It was a cat. Yeah, zakat, zakat means we also give uh, charity to the people who are poor, the needy, the homeless. So besides the five prayers, we also have a dynamic range of activities. We have the Saturday school, we have the Sunday school, we have blood drive and food drives and clothing drives. We have evening schools, we have women only program, we have how to recite Quran program. We have Hispanic Muslims who have been new converts to Islam, special program for them. And in the lobby, there's a list of maybe about 55 different programs. All right. So it's a, it's a community center, not just only for the Muslims. Every mosque is supposed to cater to the bigger population, to the greater community. So many non-Muslims, they also come there, our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues. They also come there to benefit from the many, many educational, spiritual services of the mosque. So this mosque is one of the 130 mosques in the Chicagoland area. So can you estimate how many may be in the U.S.? Anyone? Nobody Googles now, right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> About 3,000. And there are 125 uh, full-time Islamic schools in the U.S.A. And population of Muslims in the U.S.A. is approximately close to 7 million to 11 million. So what we, will do, what we will do right now is, okay, so this is the timeline of our stay here. First and foremost, uh, we are going to start off with lunch or brunch, right? Secondly, as soon as you are done with it or as you, as you take the lunch and sit down, we will start the presentation. And then one, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah go for it. So um, about the food, I didn't know uh, the other groups. I don't know how we, like I ordered for my group, so I don't know how much is there for... I, I don't know. Did you order for yours too? Great. Awesome. So is yours coming too or this is all combined together, I guess? <laughs> uh, it's paid for, I think it's there. Okay, so we'll, we can figure it out. We'll figure it out. Come sure, sure. You know what, uh, as, as we say in Islam, right? Food for one sandwich is equal to two people's sandwiches. Right? So, I mean, this is a way that we can show our, you know, human spirit, our brotherliness, our sisterliness, right? <laughs> Whatever is there, may God put blessing in it, oh. correct? And I'm not a miracle worker, I cannot multiply the food, <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, uh, so what we will do now is we will go for the food. There's a bottle of water up there, take the water, grab the sandwich and please come back over here.
If anyone wants uh, to have a paper to write uh, your notes, your questions, any which way, uh, I would just leave it here. So feel free to. Usually it's my habit to write down the important concepts. Because according to the research, if you just listen passively, you will only retain approximately 18%. If you write it down, the retention rate goes to about 38%. And if you then recite it and share with other people, the retention rates goes to like 60, 70, 80 percent. You know, it's odd that uh, no one wants to sit in the front. Why is that? <laughs> it is always like this, right? Even in the classrooms, <laughs> no one wants to sit in the front row. Oh, you have more food. Oh, okay. I was given the signal that if you guys want to take a second, some of you, feel free to. All right. So go ahead and please uh, take the sandwiches quickly. Let's start. Because we have to end at 12.50, then we will go to the mosque area, to the prayer area at 12.50 sharp. Inshallah, God willing. Okay, again, uh, I welcome and greet all of you with the Islamic greeting. How did the Islamic greeting go, by the way? You guys know it now. Assalamu alaikum. May God's peace be upon each single one of you. Now, it is my tradition that I start off with a quiz, a pop quiz. Yeah, you guys ready for it? Yeah? Yeah, come on. <laughs> all right, here is the very first question. Now, there is a major misconception, especially in the Washington, D.C., that Muslims are new to the country. We are foreigners, we are immigrants, and we don't belong here. Now, when do you think Muslims started to come to the USA? What century? Yes, sir. 18th century. Means 1700s. Is that your final answer? All right. Actually, that's not the right answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How about if I tell you that according to New York Times, Muslim presence in the USA is there since the 1529. Yeah. About 500 years. Okay, what do you think may be some of the achievements of Muslims in the USA? You know, living here for 500 years, besides inventing the falafel and the hummus, what do you think they may have contributed? I would not be happy if there is no contribution, right? Yeah. <laughs> Go for it, anyone. Would you like to take a shot? Everything. Uh, everything, really? I would be happy. <laughs> there were about many, many, actually, I don't know the number, many Muslims who took part in the Revolutionary War alongside George Washington for the freedom of the country and they, say, and they sacrificed their lives. So in 1975, a stamp was taken out to recognize the contributions and the sacrifices, even of their lives, by the Muslims in the Revolutionary War. In the Civil War, there were many, many Muslims, approximately 300, who fought alongside Abraham Lincoln for the, for the freedom of the slaves and the unity of the country. In fact, the first country that recognized the independence of the USA was none other than the, than the Muslim country of Morocco. You guys like ice cream cone? Yes. You're not getting it today. <laughs> Sorry. Right? But the fact about the ice cream cone is, in the, 
In 1904 World Fair in St. Louis, there were many vendors. One of the vendors was selling ice cream and the ice cream was a hot item. And pretty soon he ran out of the ice cream cups. Next to him was an Arab vendor. He was selling Arab desserts. So what he advised to this vendor, ice cream vendor is, why don't you roll your sweet bread in the form of a cone and put the ice cream scoop on the top and that's when the ice cream cone was invented. The next time you eat the ice cream cone, thank the Muslims. <laughs> Can you name the most mentioned prophet by name in the Quran? The Quran has names of about 25 prophets and messengers. Who do you think is mentioned the most in the Quran by name? Raise of hand. Yes, sir. Jesus. Jesus. He's mentioned 25 times, but there are many more prophets mentioned more times than Jesus. Yes, sir. Moses. Moses. All right, give me a big hand. You got it. Wonderful. Was that a guess? No, I knew that. You Googled it. Oh, I already knew that. Okay, good. I'm just picking on you. Sorry. <laughs> You know, can you imagine the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, the greatest prophet of the Jewish faith is the most mentioned prophet by name in the Quran. And the second most mentioned prophet by name in the Quran is none other than Abraham. Peace be upon him. Jesus is mentioned 25 times. Adam is mentioned 25 times. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned only five times by name. So many a times I shared this with my Christian and Jewish friends. If the Quran was coming from the mind of Muhammad, peace be upon him, why didn't he mention himself the most? Why somebody else, a prophet who came like, you know, 3,000 years before his time? Okay, here is one more question. Who is the only lady mentioned by name in the whole Quran? All right, he got it, began, give end. Yes, good job. Was that your answer too? All right, very good. Learning from him. Yeah, yeah? Like, like telepathy, yeah, yeah. right? That's what I thought. You know, can you imagine, not the name of Muhammad, peace be upon him, wife, mother, daughter, believing ladies of that time? No, none of them are mentioned by name. But a lady, quote unquote, a Jewish lady, who came 600 years before him, and he never met her. She's mentioned 32 times in the Quran with honor and respect and prestige and 18 times in the New Testament by the way all right so in fact there is a passage in the Quran chapter number 3 verse number 42 chapter 3 verse number 42 in which God is saying so an angel was sent to Mary and this angel is saying to Mary oh Mary God has chosen you and God has purified you and God has chosen you and honored you above all the ladies so that is the honor, the respect that Mary has in Islam. In fact, when it comes to Jesus, there, there are many, many miracles mentioned about Jesus in the Quran, which are also not there in the New Testament, by the way. You know, when Mary as a virgin, when she became pregnant and she delivered the baby, she brought the baby to her people. And they started to accuse her. You know, how can you do something like this, you know? fornication and adultery and all they started to accuse and started to call the names so at that time Mary she was silent there was no DNA test right no scientific test that she can say you know what uh, this is a miracle but at that time baby Jesus who was one day old he started to speak so this is there in the Quran chapter 19 verse number 30 and Jesus he said you want to know a baby? What does the baby say, right? No, it was not change my diapers. <laughs> right? So baby Jesus, this is what he said. This is the translation. That I am a servant of God. God has appointed me to be a prophet and has given me a book and has honored me to respect my mothers and to pray and to give charity as long as I live. So that, those were the very first words of Jesus mentioned in the Quran as a miracle. Then other miracles of Jesus are mentioned in the Quran. In many, many passages scattered all over the Quran. That he healed the, the lepers, the blind, the sick. That he gave rise, he gave life to the dead. So what exactly is Islam? 
I will give you four points, right? And in between the four points, if you have questions, you can raise your hand. You don't have to table the questions until, you know, end of the presentation. So the very first, the most important concept in Islam is the absolute oneness of God. So that we say that God is only one in one, not multiple persons, not multiple Godhead, not multiple idols. So we say that God is absolutely one. And he has many, many wonderful attributes. He is the creator, eternal, sustainer, powerful, merciful, forgiving, loving, guiding creator. So there are many, more than 100 attributes mentioned about God in the Quran. So the oneness of God is mentioned many, many times in the Quran. One of the times is in chapter number 112, in which the translation goes like this. They say he is God, he is Allah, one and only. He is eternal, he is needed by all. He begets not, nor he is begotten. And there is none like unto him. So this is the absolute oneness of God, saying that he does not have a father, and he does not have any progeny, no sons and daughters, and there is no one who is like God in the whole universe. So then what God said that, you know, after he created Adam, so the story of Adam and Eve is also mentioned in the Quran, very similar to the story in the Old Testament, in the, in the book of Genesis. But there is a slight difference between the story of Adam and Eve in the Old Testament compared to the story in the Quran. So God ordered Adam and Eve that do not eat from this tree, from this fruit. But then we know that somebody deceived them. And they committed the sin. So according to the Bible, who committed the very first sin? Eve, right? So, so the slight difference between Adam and Eve is that, between the Quranic and the Biblical version, is that according to the Quran, both equally Adam and Eve, they committed the very first sin. Equally. The second subtle difference between our Christian friends and Jewish friends and Islam, the Muslims is, is that after they committed the sin, according to the Quran, chapter number 2, they both asked for forgiveness and God forgave them. That means they repented to God. Oh God, please forgive us. With all sincerity, they repented. The Quran says that God forgave the sins. So in Islam, we don't believe in the original sin. We believe in the original goodness. That every child is born with a clean slate, with a pure heart, innocent, with an innate nature to only worship the one creator. So then God appointed many, many prophets, many, many messengers all throughout the land. So this is point number two, right? Point number one is the absolute oneness of God. Point number two is the prophethood and the messengership of prophets and messengers. So it says in the Quran, chapter 16, verse number 36, that God has appointed prophets and messengers. And their job was to invite people to only worship one God, submit to one God. So that submission to one God in Arabic is Islam. Worshipping him alone, following his guidance. If a person is doing that, we say that that person is a Muslim. So again, tying this concept to all the prophets, we say, that Adam was given the message of submission to one God. That means the message of Islam. We say that Abraham was given the message of Islam. Means that he should submit to one God and he should invite his people to submit to one God. Noah and Abraham and Moses and Solomon and David and Ishmael and Isaac and Jesus and Muhammad. Peace be upon all of them. We say they came with that same message. So we say that all the prophets were Muslims. Even Jesus is mentioned as a Muslim in the Quran. So that's concept number two, the concept of prophethood. Concept number three would be that humanity, we need guidance. The creation, we need guidance. So God has given many scriptures in the past. So the Quran mentions four, actually five scriptures. A scripture given to Abraham, given to Moses, given to David, given to Jesus, and the last scripture given to Muhammad, peace be upon all of them. So it's a fundamental belief of Muslims that we have to respect and believe in the original scriptures given to all the prophets and messengers. However, when it comes to our guidance, we say we go to the last scripture that was given through Muhammad, peace be upon him, for all of humanity, that is the Quran. 
So the Quran has many, many important themes in there. It speaks about the oneness of God. Quran speaks about the purpose of life is that we should worship God and help out humanity and the creation. Quran speaks about the solutions for humanity's problems. Drug problem, alcohol, gambling, breakdown of the family structure, racism, homicide, suicide, any problem humanity is going through, the Quran has solution for it. So Quran along with the example of Muhammad peace be upon him, they form the two sources of Islam. So Quran and we say the Sunnah. Sunnah means the example of Muhammad peace be upon him. How he practiced the Quran, how he implemented the guidance of the Quran upon himself, his family and the society. The Quran and the Sunnah. Sunnah means the example of Muhammad peace be upon him. Right? So that is uh, the third important concept in Islam which is God's guidance through the scriptures. And the last and the most important, and all of them are important, would be the concept of the hereafter. That all the humans, all of humanity, the whole creation is going to pass away. Only God knows the time, the day. But after we pass away, it says in the Quran, many multiple places, that humanity would be brought back to life. So there would be a day of resurrection. On the day of resurrection, all of humanity, whoever lived, they would be standing individually in front of God. And God would be asking certain questions. Two of those important questions would be that what kind of belief that you have and what kind of deeds that you have done. Means believing in the absolute oneness of God and doing good deeds according to the scriptures. Those would be the criteria according to the Quran for a person to receive God's mercy and be eligible to go to paradise. It's not just the deeds, by the way, but also God's mercy comes into play. And obviously, Islam, very similar to Christianity, also believes in the hellfire. You know, just like suppose if any child goes to school, does not obey the teacher, does not complete the assignment, doesn't obey the policies, there would be consequences. So the Quran also says that there would be consequences for a person if he or she does not obey God and follows God's commandments, there is hellfire. So these are the four important basic concepts in Islam. So what I would do is, I would uh, open the floor for any Q&A or any topic that you want me to touch or go into detail. We have approximately 23 minutes for Q&A. Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question is, if people are good, innately good, where is the evil came from, right? We say that there is a guidance of God, and then there is a misguidance of Satan, and is a misguidance of own human shortcoming. So God has given us a free choice. So he has made us innately good, but he also has given us the choices. If we make the wrong choices, obviously... It, we may suffer, humanity may suffer, has given. Some people are making the right choices and those who are making the wrong choices, they can be one of the reasons for evil in the world. But then the follow-up question can be that suppose if a person makes the wrong choice, what is the way for repentance in Islam, right? So in Islam, we don't have any mediator that we go through. We don't have, unlike Catholicism, we don't go and... Uh, confess for the sins to the Imam of the mosque. There are four or five basic steps a Muslim has to do for the sin to be taken care of. Number one, the person has to acknowledge that they have committed the sin. That's really important. Secondly, they have to come sincerely to repent to God. Number third, when they repent to God, they should not repent through any mediator, not through Muhammad, peace be upon him, not through any saint, any idol, any Jesus, peace be upon him. We go and repent directly to God. Number fourth would be, we should be making a commitment not to commit that sin again. And number five, do some good things, extra good things, you know, just to wash away that sin. And if we do that, God says in the Quran, chapter 4, verse number 116, that God is willing to forgive all the sins, all the sins. But there is only one sin that God says he's not going to forgive if the person dies with that sin. Which sin do you think is the unforgivable sin in Islam? If the person dies with that, yes. 
What's that mean? Yeah, I was looking at you. <laughs> Wasn't it like a, a apostasy? Was the word? Not apostasy, by the way, but apostasy is obviously a sin too. But uh, you guys know it. Would yes. That, would that be murder? Because murder is also a big one of the heinous sins. The unforgivable sin would be blasphemy. Shoot. Shoot. Okay. So, so the so the Muslim brother is saying associating partners with God means committing shirk. So if a person says that, you know what, there is God, but you know, this person or this idol or this human is also having the attributes of God. So that is associating partners in Islam. So if a person associate partners and does not repent and comes and worships only one God and dies like that, worshiping or associating partners, that is the only unforgivable sin in Islam. All right, uh, and you had a question, someone around this area. Yes. I had a question. Uh, it was about, about the hadith. Since you since you haven't touched upon it, so I was like, like here, like what is? Okay, fine. So, so the question is about the hadith. So, within the umbrella of Islamic knowledge, all right. This is Islam 101 here. <laughs> within the umbrella of Islamic knowledge, you have the Quran, which is the Word of God, the primary source of Islam. And the second source of Islam I mentioned is the Sunnah which is the example of Muhammad, peace be upon him. One would be the actual sayings of Muhammad, peace be upon him. What he said, what he approved, what he disapproved, those are collected in different volumes. Quran is one volume. And these are collected in different volumes. And these are called as the book of Hadith. Yes, ma'am. In Christianity, there's a lot of different traditions within the idea of Christianity and lots of different like variations on what the basic doctrine is. Um, does Islam have that as well? Lots of different ideas on what the original scriptures mean, interpretations? Okay, so the question is, in Christianity, there may be different denominations and sects. Would there be something similar in Islam, different interpretations? Yes and no. No, because all the Muslims around the world, we, are, we hold fast to the basic fundamental beliefs of Islam. The variations that we see would be the matters which are not as fundamental. For example, all the Muslims around the world, we have the same concept of God. That all the Muslims say that God is absolutely one. Doesn't have sons and daughters and uncles and aunts. No multiple persons within Godhead. One in one. All the Muslims. But our Christian friends, they may differ about the concept of God. For example, our Jehovah's Witness friends, they may not agree with the concept of Trinity. But our Catholic and Protestants, they say that concept of God is Trinity. Our Unitarians, they say that God is not God does not have a son, nor is a triune concept. So you have three different denominations, three different variations. When it comes to the Quran, all the Muslims around the world, we have only have one Quran, one version of the Quran. We pick up a copy of the Quran in India or in Iran, or in Saudi Arabia, or in the US, in Arabic they would be exactly alike. So one version of the Quran. But our Christian brothers and sisters, they may have different versions of the Bible. For example, our Protestant brothers and sisters, they may have a Bible that has 66 books. Our Catholic friends, they may have a Bible that has 73 books. Our Greek Orthodox, they have a Bible in which there are 78 books in there. So Muslims are united again in the book when it comes to who is Muhammad peace be upon him all the Muslims are unanimous that he is a man he's flesh and blood he's a prophet of God he's not son of God he's not divine he's not part of any trinity out there when it comes to how Muslims pray we face which direction what do we face when we pray Mecca right yeah so in Mecca is the Kaaba which is the holy the most ancient house of worship that Abraham built along with his son Ishmael. So all the Muslims around the world, we face the same direction. So when I was in India, I used to face the western direction. So from here we face the northeastern direction, correct? But then how would you know that which direction is, suppose if I'm traveling from here to Michigan to your school, for example. If I stop at the resting place, how would I know that where is Mecca? How do I, where, which place should I face? 
suppose the, it's cloudy out there, you cannot see the sun, right? How do you think Muslims will find out? There is an app for it. <laughs> there is. Right? So all the Muslims are united by this facing the same direction. We are all united by the, by the concept of the hereafter. So yes, there are some small differences. You know, when we pray, should we put the hands here or hands over here or put it to the side? But those differences are not a fundamental deciding factor for who would be admitted to paradise. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Good. Yes, sir. Jeremy, yourself, oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. You talk about the unity, um, and maybe it's just all the food I'm eating, but do you, is there a, can you speak a little bit about the Sunni-Shia split and maybe how there are some things that both sides may believe, but then also what they may disagree about? Okay? Yes, yes, that's a good question. That's kind of a follow-up to your question. That what about the Sunnis and the Shias? Where are the commonalities and where can be some differences? So first and foremost, it's really important that where did this God started? When Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was alive, okay, when do you think Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born? What year, approximately? 570, he started to receive revelation when he was 40 years of age through angel Gabriel, obviously coming from God. Then he passed away in the year 632. So when he was alive, he was the head of the state and he was also a prophet. But after he passed away, the Muslims have to elect a new head of the state, not a new prophet, because the Quran says in chapter 33, verse number 40, that Muhammad, peace be upon him, he's the last and the final messenger. So after he passed away, there were two groups of people. One group, they want to elect Abu Bakr as the very first caliph. The second group, they want to elect Ali as the first caliph, means the first head of the state. It so happened that by the democratic process, the major group, they won and their person, Abu Bakr, he became the very first caliph. He was the most eligible, Ali was eligible too, by the way. So the split was not because of theological reason. Initially, it was because of political reason, number one. Number two, you know, in the Quran, the follower of Islam, there is only one name to them. It is Muslim. It says in chapter 22, verse number 78, that the follower of Islam is called as a Muslim. So what about some of the differences? So the major difference between the Sunni part of the Muslims compared to the Shia would be that we say that the successorship should be to the most eligible person. But according to our Shia brothers and sisters, what they say is that it should be in the lineage of Muhammad, peace be upon him. So that is kind of the major difference. But then what about some infighting, right? The many, many, not centuries, but at least decades of infighting. I would say that that is mostly because of the geopolitical nature of the, of the area. Oil, greed, money, uh, land, power. These are some of the factors, by the way. You know, just like our Christian friends, unfortunately, they have fought for many, many centuries. You know, that hundred year war. It is not because of Christianity or the Bible. It is just a human shortcoming. Just taking out a few differences and making a big deal and then fighting the different denominations and different sects. So it is a human shortcoming and many foreign powers, unfortunately, they were fueling the fire. Right? We were supporting what initially Iran or Iraq and then Russia was supporting Iran and then they became a proxy fight. So these are the factors and Islam, it says in chapter 3 verse number 104 that all the Muslims, they should hold fast to the rope of God, which is the Quran and not make divisions in there. So in case if you see some Muslims making divisions, it is their shortcoming and we should not blame Islam for it. Yes, sir. I guess in the sense that he brought like the Sunni Shias, like I'm like, what about, I guess what I'm now considered like, what about the Sufis? Okay, what about the Sufis, right? So now within the umbrella of Islam, there are many groups, they may call different names based upon their understanding of Islam. So there is one Islam, that's the most important thing. There is no Sunni Islam, Shia Islam, Sufi Islam, Wahhabi Islam, there is one Islam. 
a slight interpretation would be different. So when it comes to our Sufi brothers and sisters, they emphasize more on the spiritual side of Islam. They may stay in the mosque, they may have their rituals of reciting the names of God, connecting with God. So they are more into the spiritual aspect of Islam. But when you look at Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was a dynamic person. He had spiritual connection with God, but then he also used to implement the, uh, the, the commandments of God in the society. So when it comes to the neighbors, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that you're not a full believer if you eat your full and if your neighbors are hungry. So we as Muslims, we are supposed to be, yes, connecting with God spiritually, be in the mosque certain times, but out there in the society and joining good, forbidding evil, fighting racism, taking care of minorities, building the society better. These are all part of being a Muslim and not just the spiritual aspect of Islam. You had a question. Yeah, so uh, in the Bible, specifically in the Old Testament, we have a lot of verses that speak about violence towards people um, and violence towards cities and such. Um, we have a lot of context. Okay, so the question is, the Old Testament speaks about fighting, violence, killing people. The Quran has passages about fighting, but every single fight in the Quran has to be about self-defense. For example, chapter 2, verse number 190, God says, fight in the cause of God for those who are fighting against you. Means somebody is coming to compromise your life, your liberty, your freedom, your land, your family, your property, God has given a, you know, God-given right to take up arms and defend yourself. So let me complete the verse. It says in there, fight in the cause of God for those who fight against you, but do not go, do not go to extreme because God does not love the extremist. So as a last resort, Islam gives the permission to fight, but even in that just fight, we are not supposed to go overboard and do things that we are not supposed to. But then your question can be, what are some of the things that we should be limiting ourselves with? It says in the Quran chapter 5 verse number 32, that taking one innocent life is like taking the life of all of humanity. That's how careful Muslims are supposed to be in a just war. Forget about any time, but even in a war, we are not supposed to touch kill or harm any non-combatants. If they're doing that, they're going against the passages of the Quran. So in case if you see some Muslim in some country, out of their ignorance, they are killing non-Muslims, minorities, forcefully converting people, you know, oppressing the women, they're going against the clear-cut teachings of the Quran. Then Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Islam teaches that the etiquettes of war no non-combatants. So there is no carpet bombing in Islam. There is no Hiroshima Nagasaki in Islam. Really important. And we cannot destroy the crops, the resources, the water resources, electrical resources, any resources even of the enemy population. And if the enemy inclined towards peace, the Quran says in chapter 81 verse number 6, you also incline towards peace. Means drop your weapons, shake hands, sign a peace treaty. That's what Islam says. You know, let's not judge Christianity by what the Crusades may have done or the, or the Spanish Inquisition or, or the slave trades or the genocide of the Native Americans. They are done by the so-called Christians. We should not blame the Bible or Christianity. In the same way, all of you, our non-Muslim friends, we should not blame Islam for what some misguided people may be doing, some bad apples of the society. If they are using the word jihad or sharia or freedom and Allahu Akbar and if they are killing innocent people, we should blame them, we should condemn them, they don't belong to us. But Islam is a faith of peace with wonderful guidance. I hope that's really understood by all of us, right? Yes. Uh, what about uh, your, your opinion on, for instance, the Battle of Badr or uh, the Quraysh, you know, how, how the Prophet, I mean, I understand how like the Muslims, you know, uh, we, 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 I understand your opinion on that, but what about the Prophet himself, like how he treated the Quraysh? Okay, fine. So, so the question is, what about how the Prophet treated the Quraysh? In one minute, we have to go, by the way. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Historical battle. So really quickly, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was preaching Islam, oneness of God, in Mecca for 10 years. No, actually 13 years. 
Then some people did not like it, some people liked it, some people embraced it. But there were many enemies who were polytheists. So they eventually came after his life and he had to go to Medina. So the non-Muslims in Mecca, they took away the property of the Muslims, they tortured the Muslims, they killed some of the Muslims and they came to do assassination on the Prophet himself. So he moved to, he moved to Medina. Even to Medina, they did not left him alone. They have battle after battle. The very first battle was Badr. So in that self-defense battle, that's when the war took place because they wanted to destroy Islam Muslim and the true Islamic state. So what we will do is we'll have more Q&A by the way, awesome questions, especially you and you and all of you. But I want this side also to ask questions. Yeah. yeah? Okay, so the ladies, our sisters, you can join the two or three ladies in the back. Uh, just, just, Zainab, raise your hand too. All of you raise your hand. The sisters, join them. They will take you to the ladies' area. The men, you can go with me and Brother Imran and the two volunteers. The men, we will go to the main hall. We will sit on the area for the men. With that again, thank you very much. We'll come back again here right after the prayer. Before we go inside the main prayer hall, one of the etiquettes would be we take off our shoes. So there are shoe racks, but important, make sure where you left your shoes. There would be amongst 1,000 pairs of shoes. All right? Good luck. <laughs>